This meeting is being recorded. And finally, I would like to mention that Soul's work, and in particular this, this project and many others, are only made possible by the generous and ongoing support of Gaia Co College. So with that, I would like to turn over the mic to, to Pamela. Thank you very much. Um, and just as a shout out to my family, the last name is Zevit. Um, we're really proud of that last name, so <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, when I send them the link so that they know. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yes, my, my name is Pamela Sevet. I'm the biodiversity conservation planner for the city of Surrey uh, from a geographic context that's in southwest British Columbia. Um, we're a fairly large municipality that's in the southern part of the Metro Vancouver regional area, and uh, we kind of share a border with uh, the United States. So. Um, we're kind of, you know, north to south uh, have, have many borders, including international ones as well. So the project I'm going to talk about today um, is one that has gotten a little bit of recognition uh, and uh, we're really proud that uh, um, Seoul actually felt it worthy of getting the Greener Green Spaces recognition. Um, that's been a really phenomenal feather in our cap for the work that we're doing around uh, introducing biodiversity objectives into public lands across the city. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of contextual information um, where this is all coming from. Uh, my position in the city of Surrey is relatively unique for municipalities in Canada. Um, and it's all tied to strategic directions that the city took a number of years ago uh, around commitments to biodiversity conservation. And I'll talk about how some of the recent work that I've been doing that kind of led concurrently to this project and to the Greener Green Spaces recognition uh, and the project itself, and then sort of wrap things up at the end. And how does this all relate to the principles um, around Greener Green Spaces? So just from a contextual standpoint, um, back in 2011, the city of Surrey started to undertake comprehensive uh, planning around its biodiversity assets through an ecosystem management study. And that led in 2014 to a citywide biodiversity conservation strategy. And uh, we're actually only one of about 28% municipalities in Canada that, that have biodiversity conservation strategies of some sort or another. That was endorsed by council uh, and moved forward to a revamp in our sustainability charter, which um, raised the prominence of ecosystems and biodiversity as being one of the key pillars. In 2016, uh, we had updates to our official community plan, which included changes to bylaws that integrated the biodiversity conservation strategy components and more specifically something called the green infrastructure network which is the backbone of biodiversity conservation in the city uh, so we have something called the sensitive ecosystem development permit area and that's relatively unique for municipalities it, it bundles in protection of our water courses as well as upland terrestrial habitats, um, which is often something that we don't see happening because from a regulatory standpoint, it's usually stuff with fish or um, wetlands and water courses that typically receive some level of protection or guidelines around development. My position started in 2019 and one of the first things that I started working on was figuring out how can we translate all of the objectives around the biodiversity conservation strategy to the site level. We have this very holistic, comprehensive strategy for the city, but we need to have tools and resources that say a developer or the individual resident and the city ourselves can use across the landscape. So from 2020 to 2021, um, I worked with a consulting team on developing the biodiversity design guidelines for the city which really bring down those objectives to the site level. And they range everywhere from uh, biodiversity related planting palettes to addressing light pollution, uh, addressing wildlife movements across the landscape and roads, maintained landscapes, et cetera. Um, and I'll provide a link at the end of the presentation that you can go to our landing page to look at all of these resources. But the biodiversity design guidelines were a bit of a jumping point for us uh, in regards to these site level initiatives and all of the other complementary work that's been happening over the last few years. I should note in regards to Surrey, 
We are one of the fastest growing municipalities in British Columbia. We have approximately 580,000 people in our population. About half of that is an immigrant population. So we're very culturally dynamic. We're likely going to meet and potentially surpass the city of Vancouver um, over the coming decades. Because uh, we're looking at close to 800,000 people within at least the next 20 years, if not sooner. But we also are, from an area standpoint, the largest municipality in Metro Vancouver, and a third of our land base, land base is in something called the Agricultural Land Reserve, which is a legislative tool to protect agricultural land. One in four residents live uh, in Surrey, in Metro Vancouver. And we still support, because of that land base, and because of that interesting mosaic in regards to our landscape, support a significant amount of biodiversity natural assets um, across the city. So while the biodiversity conservation strategy was really designed to identify a biodiversity across the city and set in place um, the key components that needed to be protected and managed for biodiversity objectives now and into the future, the biodiversity design guidelines brought those particular objectives down to the site level. So the different types of tools and resources that we could employ to protect biodiversity, wildlife, floristic values, et cetera, um, whether it was a backyard or a local park. And just a little bit of a breakdown as to what is contained within the biodiversity design guidelines. There are eight modules, as I mentioned, that cover the gambit, uh, everything from light pollution to maintain landscapes to road ecology, uh, green roofs and green walls, et cetera. Uh, and they're really all about you know, how we can implement the, and create uh, actionable biodiversity objectives rather than just thinking of it as a holistic strategy. This is just an example of one of the key components from one of the modules for habitat structures and shows how the biodiversity design guidelines rolls everything together. Um, and if you think about the greener green spaces principles, you start to see some of these things reflected. There is a lot of complementarity um, between the biodiversity design guidelines and the objectives for greener green spaces. So where does that bring us to? Well, um, back in 2020, um, my position works collaboratively across departments and I was asked by our park planning group to be involved in development uh, at what would be one of our newest parks within the city. Now this particular park, Edgewood, um, used to be a, sort of a brownfield site. It was an equestrian center historically and had been heavily disturbed. It had a lot of natural assets around it. And we'll take a look at a contextual map in just a second. Uh, but more importantly, it also had part of our green infrastructure network, uh, mainly a wildlife corridor running through it. And as part of the discussion, when we started looking at the context of Edgewood Park, it's like, how can we enhance biodiversity objectives in a park that is really geared more towards active use for the surrounding community? And if you look at this air photo, you can see the various uh, levels of habitat values that occur within the area. Edgewood Park is the uh, red rectangle in the center there. And it's also part of our green infrastructure network, which is the area that basically um, runs sort of through the park and then continues on into high habitat suitability areas throughout. The southwest part of the city where Edgewood exists is actually one of our fastest growing areas of the city. Um, you can tell on the air photo, you can see a lot of very high density subdivisions going in. And uh, that's pretty much what is slated for that area of the city in a lot of other areas that are typically green space now, but again, private land. So we're looking at ways that our public spaces and our public lands can help to accommodate biodiversity objectives as well as meet public expectations around green space values. the type of wildlife we want to move around there. We have Colombian blacktail deer, which are a subspecies of deer found on the coast, as well as a high pollinator usage for these areas. So um, this whole discussion about how do we integrate pollinator habitat into this park, along with maintaining connectivity for the wildlife corridor that surrounds the park, um, how, what is that going to look like and what could that mean and what would it entail? Uh, by no means, this is the only pollinator habitat that we have in the city, but it was rather unique and we hope that it would set a bit of a bar 
for future park development when we're planning them to say, these are the components that we want to integrate into new and upcoming parks, whether it's you know a little postage stamp area to support pollinators, or in the case of Edgewood, something a little bit more substantial. The pollinator habitat, which is in the southwest corner of the park, provides a continuum from the wildlife corridor to a future community garden that'll be going in there into the wildlife corridor that now stretches along the west side of the park and to the north. Um, and it's about 350 square meters. So it's not teeny, it's not huge, but it's not teeny by any means. And there are a lot of other amenities that this park has that are important for social cohesion uh, and active use by residents. Um, this just provides one more natural asset that can we, we can use to help promote biodiversity values in the city. So this is an example of the planting palette that was developed for the pollinator area. Specifically, this part of the city uh, is part of what's called the coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimatic zone. Uh, the province of BC is broken up into these biogeoclimatic zones and the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem is one of the rarest ecosystems in the southwest part of the province of BC. So the planting palette was really designed to focus more on a very xeric landscape. So a lot of sunlight, typically low rainfall areas and plants that would typically occur in sort of interior dry ecosystems as well as the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem. In this particular situation, we selected native plants only, although certainly in other areas, um, we do look at non-invasive non-native plants uh, as part of the planting palettes. Um, but the focus here is more, as I said, on the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem. And also because we were very close to the marine environment, the Salish Sea is not too far. You can actually see just through one of the um, uh, nearby residential areas, you can actually see the ocean from Edgewood Park. And especially if you stand on the pollinator meadow, because it's a bit of a knoll area. So the planting palette was selected to deal with environmental conditions. We used a special, special soil composition that was different from the rest of the park to try to mimic some of those um, natural ecosystem values. And we wanted to make sure that it was going to be resilient and drought tolerant, um, which became very important because of what happened last summer. So um, it's a good testament to the, the different types of approaches that we're taking. It was also important to note that the pollinator meadow became uh, a very um, well-received and highlighted amenity for the park once the park was opened. Um, it's because it was a bit of an experiment, but we're starting to find that the public is really looking to see this type of um, sort of multi-use and, and mosaic approach to park planning. So I'm just gonna give you a bit of a timeline. So we started from scratch. That's me at the top of the knoll. I'm playing queen of the knoll there. Um, we actually did seeding by hand. So this is again, 350 square meters. Um, we retained some of the uh, native tree cover in the center of the knoll. Those are black cottonwoods. Um, special soil mix that was more on the sand side than the organic side, which is uh, atypical for um, most amended soil mixes for parks. Um, but again, we were planting drought tolerant plants to be growing in these types of soil com um, compositions. And then into the winter after hand seeding, um, it was a really interesting experiment because we didn't know what was going to propagate and what was going to propagate well. Uh, it was interesting to see though that the plant that came in and, and by weight was the dominant one um, was uh, farewell to spring or a Clarkia species it typically is grown throughout Southwest BC and interior prairie areas. It's a per, it's um, sorry an annual, and it was the only annual in the plant mix, but it uh, germinated right away and provided some cover for the soil in a very quick fashion. And then we were wondering, you know, what was going to germinate next? Because we ideally wanted a planting palette that was going to provide pollinator resources, whether it was uh, nectar resources or larval host plants for butterflies from uh, as late in the winter as we could get in regards to climate up until late fall. We don't wanna have things that are just going to be really showy for a short, short period of time and only provide resources for a short period of time. We wanna to try to mimic as much as possible how uh, natural ecosystems flourish over the seasons. 
So moving into 2021, on the left-hand side, that's the Clarkia in full bloom uh, in late June 2021. A number of other plants were actually coming up. The grasses did very well. They were about 25% of the composition for the plant mix. And for then, you know, those of you who are aware of what happened in BC um, in late June, early July 2021, we had a heat dome. So this was an extreme heat event that affected the majority of the province. Uh, so within a few weeks, that is what the meadow looked like after the heat dome. Um, it looked like a fire had gone through it. Um, when I say it got toasted, I'm literally saying that um, the whole area looked a bit scorched earth. Uh, but it's important to note that the plants that were planted there are designed to actually be able to tolerate these types of um, drought situations and high heat events because they're normally growing in very um, uh, harsh environments. At that time, uh, right before the uh, hard opening of the park, in July. Uh, so we had some blooming happening there. It was, uh, we had a soft opening during full bloom, but the actual ribbon coming ceremony happened right after the heat dome. So there wasn't anything, it was beyond our control. We couldn't actually, you know, make, make the meadow bloom again or anything like that. Um, but we did implement pollinator signage as part of the work that we're doing. And we're looking to actually enhance that signage into much broader interpretive signage around pollinator conservation. And we'll use that as a standard template across the city uh, down the road. But this meadow was the first one where we attempted to do this sort of signage to get people to realize that these meadow environments are actually distinct from the surrounding parkland. So bringing us forward into 2022, um, this is what spring looked like at the meadow. Uh, the grasses have rebounded and a number of the uh, floristic components were also starting to germinate quite well. Um, we don't expect with an annual like the Clarkia that you're going to get that full reseeding happening. It's kind of like the, the first year you get the big bang um, with the annual. Um, but then now we're looking at all the different perennials that are starting to come in. So this coincided with our application in the fall of 2021 to Seoul for the Greener Green Spaces recognition. And we were awarded that in early 2022. Um, so I'm very proud of that. And uh, the picture that's on the right-hand side is what it looked like this past weekend. So we're getting uh, different floristic components coming in. Um, this isn't the entire meadow, but I have noted that we're getting plants coming in that were seeded back in 2020 and are finally starting to germinate now. It takes usually about four years for meadows to actually settle and for the plant components to actually figure out who's going to dominate. But it's also important to note, you know, as part of long term maintenance that these are managed ecosystems and managed landscapes. You know, nature would be doing its own thing, including, you know, fires, etc, all of these other events that would be happening. Um, this is one that will require management and maintenance in perpetuity. Uh, the big thing is ensuring that invasive plant species and weedy species um, that are occurring in surrounding areas are not taking over the site. So that's going to be ongoing management. And part of my work has been to sort of monitor the amount of maintenance and management that is going in, how much weed control is occurring, and it's all hand weeding. Um, we have actually been partnering with our Surrey Natural Areas Partnership, which is a youth program that the city runs every year to employ youth in natural area restoration to help with the weeding and it's a good mentorship opportunity to learn about pollinator habitat and the work that the city is doing around biodiversity conservation. Uh, and now we're moving forward in respect to also developing uh, more broader interpretive signage around pollinator conservation habitat for the various types of pollinator areas that we have within the city. So I'm going to be monitoring this um, for at least another few years and keeping on top of the weeding uh, and then I'm doing it uh, monthly at this point, sometimes more frequently, depending on the time of the year, especially in the spring. Uh, and we'll be looking at potentially, you know, are there other types of habitat features we can introduce? We have some uh, boulder clusters in there. It would be nice to have some down wood in there to provide more habitat. Potentially we can look at um, adding bat box in the trees there um, for local bat species. Uh, is there an opportunity to add for solitary bees like mason bees to add a feature in there and other types of things that we can add to improve overall uh, values for wildlife. 
And as I said, this is becoming an important connectivity component for the wildlife corridor um, that sits on either side adjacent to it. In respect to uh, public engagement on this, um, Edgewood Park was formally opened, as I noted last summer. Um, and for the first time, we really have integrated and highlighted the, ball, the pollinator component and the pollinator meadow as part of the park profile. And we're looking to do that in a more consistent fashion with other parks across the city. Because the majority of our parks do get profiles on our website um, and where we can start highlighting biodiversity components that would really complement our efforts around implementing the biodiversity conservation strategy and keeping that sort of in the forefront of the work that we do. And when um, the greener green spaces recognition was received, um, we did a, a bit of a media blitz on that um, to ensure that it was highlighted. It was a very important part of our street cred from a park standpoint um, and for the city as well. And um, you know, looking forward to actually transferring out uh, a lot of the learning outcomes from this project so that we can make it more of a citywide approach uh, in respect to the principles. One of the other things that this project led to concurrently was a stronger focus on pollinator habitat and pollinator conservation. And this was a project that I submitted for my certification with Pollinator Partnership Canada as a pollinator habitat steward. steward. And I received that certification um, back in May. And uh, we have other staff who have other projects that we're drawing from this site on, that they're implementing some of the learning outcomes for their projects. And uh, probably within the next few weeks, the city as an organization will receive cert or sorry, certification from Pollinator Partnership Canada, and we will become a Pollinator Steward Certified City. Um, so this site has really been important for a number of reasons. Um, and for me as a conservation biologist, it's, it's all about the learning outcomes and the constant lifelong learning that go towards ensuring that um, we continue to explore how we can deliver biodiversity objectives across the city, but also you know, how well are our projects working? How do we refine the monitoring approaches that we take? And how can we ensure that, you know, we're doing the right plant selection for each site? Because it can vary. We're not going to just directly say, this will be the planting palette that we're going to use everywhere. Uh, it's, it's always about adaptive management and resiliency with these projects. And of course, I want to note that the city has a range of different sites. We do have pollinator beds and other um, parks. We have park gardens and garden parks. Um, the garden parks are really botanical gardens, and we have two main ones that are very high profile in the city. Um, and this is all part of that diverse mosaic that makes up our public, public spaces. Um, and the recognition that the site has received has been very important as part of that. So how does this all align with greener green spaces? Well, thinking about um, what the principles are, for having this site recognized. Uh, biodiversity was, of course, one of the top ones. Um, we've been looking at changing our soil uh, composition practices and thinking about soil as being an integral part of these sites. One of the reasons that plants were selected the way they were so that we would actually have areas where there was open soil available because a number of invertebrates need to have that. It's not just about having a thick cover of vegetation and wildlife benefit from having that type of mosaic as well. Uh, it's definitely minimizing the um, energy consumption aspect of it because it's all hand weeded. It was hand germinated and hand sown and it's been hand weeded and will continue to be so in the future. Uh, and over time as the meadow is tended and ideally over years as it becomes more self-sufficient and we see more of a dominance of the native plantings that are in there, there'll be less and less requirement to have to do weeding, et cetera. And then, you know, we don't use synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. We have a cosmetic pesticide bylaw within the city. And uh, other than using amended soil mixes that may have compost in them, we generally don't fertilize uh, our sites within parkland. And so thinking about how all of, the, all of that ties into the pollinator meadow at Edgewood, the recognition that, that we've received um, supports all of these principles. And of course, you know, even if it's a site specific area, it intrinsically supports all of the objectives that we're trying to achieve in regards to the biodiversity conservation strategy um, for the city, as well as the biodiversity design guidelines. Think about it 
um, given the receptivity that the community has had to having these natural asset amenities within our parks, um, that it's um, really been beneficial for the community. It, it raises awareness amongst the community when it comes to biodiversity and pollinator, pollinator conservation. Uh, and it ensures that we're maintaining uh, resiliency within our green infrastructure network, which is really important for connecting the dots across the city um, for biodiversity objectives. And that over time, it's going to be something that we can replicate um, in various other locations, whether it be a streetscape um, or another fairly large park amenity. So I'm going to end the formal presentation there. Uh, the website, if you'd like to look at all of the work that we're doing around biodiversity conservation in Surrey, just go to surrey.ca slash biodiversity and you'll be able to access our existing projects as well as a link to the biodiversity design guidelines to look at for further uh, information. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was very well said, um, very well presented. The information is just so useful for Seoul. Uh, for for yourself, I think going through this uh, process anyway, of not only working on such an interesting project that you know will help shape some of the further work that the municipality will will be implementing, and maybe all the other municipalities that have a, a similar biodiversity strategy, um, it's so useful. And I love how you have focused a lot of the attention on what are the outcomes of this. And um, I'm, I have questions, but I'm also going to invite participants now, if they would like to put any in the chat, if they would like to indicate that they would like to ask a question directly. Otherwise, I, I will start right now and, and please go ahead. Um, so I just yeah, was curious um, about, as you said, your, your role, not only in as a planner and helping to design and create this particular space, but is also in the monitoring of it and maintenance. You said this is going to be, you know, for, forevermore now sort of a, a managed yeah. a managed area. It sort of has to be. It's not sort of left now to its own devices. So can you speak a little bit about your role as a city um, planner? Sure. Um, so um, I just want to check if you can put it in the chat. Um, I want to make sure that things haven't frozen up because I noticed that Christine that you've frozen up so if somebody can put in the chat that uh, you can still hear me and see me. I can see and hear you. Okay, good. Thanks, Rose. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, so, you know, in regards to my role in the city, uh, my background is I'm a registered professional biologist and it's kind of interesting, you know, biologist that does planning. Um, so the focus of the position is implementing our biodiversity conservation strategy, and uh, there was no formal roadmap when I started uh, for doing that. Um, so it's been looking at all of the recommendations, objectives, and goals that are within the strategy and figuring out, you know, how to, what does it mean to implement that? So these types of projects are, are ways of actually doing that. Um, and... So moving forward, uh, I work very closely with our park planning group, but I also work with engineering and planning and development. My position is housed within our parks division in park rec and culture, um, but the strategy itself is a citywide strategy. So I work collaboratively with a number of different departments across the city. And you know, these types of projects are not just limited to parks. Uh, we're looking at you know, from green infrastructure, from, from an engineered standpoint, so like physical things that we develop, uh, our engineering department looking at how we can implement things like rain gardens and other types of projects like these, um, whether it's, you know, in, in roadways and things like that, where we want to actually bump up the natural asset values of, of really heavily engineered areas. And the long-term maintenance for these sites, it's something that we need to be cognizant of. Um, you know, it's really easy for me to have very blue sky ideas and say, oh, let's put a pollinator meadow in here and we need to have this and we need to have that. Um, but we need to think about, you know, what it takes to actually implement these, these projects, uh, be strategic about where they're going to go, what's needed at the site level, what's the context for those sites. And then long term, you know, what does it take to maintain them with this particular site? Um, you know, the idea is that the planting palette will dominate um, any potential weedy species, 
as long as it's cared for in such a way that that, that is given the upper edge. Uh, and that ideally there will be less and less requirement over time. Um, the plant and pallet, as I said, is designed to actually provide for um, being resilient in very harsh conditions. And that was the intention because there's no irrigation here. Uh, the grass, which is uh, a large component of the active use section of the park, probably does contribute um, from its irrigation a little bit to this area, but it's, it's actually a knoll, it's a high point. So drainage is going in the opposite direction. So this site had to be planned to actually be um, self-sufficient over time. And obviously, you know, from my position standpoint, I'm ne not necessarily going to be around to actually be weeding it by hand all the time, um, you know, for 20 years from now, there's gotta be some longevity uh, built into the planning. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions right now? No. Okay, so another one, well, that I was interested in, as you said, when, when the park first opened, there was some media blitz, like it was nice to see that a park, you know, gained a little bit of media attention to, to be announced and um, promoted. And there was a quote in it from one of the city councillors that was basically saying that we invest in roads, we invest in, um, in other gray infrastructure, basically, but green infrastructure is top of mind for council. And would you, um, would you say that that sort of because of some of the needs, the the heat dome, the idea that we're council or governments um, are recognizing the need to have these spaces that are fulfilling that role of being uh, resilient and and there to provide sort of some ecological services, is that do you think this is going to expand in the future where like the recognition is there or it's growing for these types of green or well green spaces that are in the public realm and the importance of them? Uh, the short answer, yes. So, um, you know, as an example in the past year, we're just finalizing an urban forest management strategy for the city, which connects a lot of these dots. Um, and also there's a lot of recognition around nature-based solutions in dealing with climate change. Um, we have a climate action strategy that is also being finalized that has, um, you know, one of the key pillars is ecosystems. So. Um, you know, we're, we're making all those connections as an organization, as a city, and recognizing that um, natural assets are going to be key to our ability to deal with adaptation and mitigation. Uh, we also are undertaking a multi-million dollar uh, initiative around coastal flood adaptation, which involves, you know, looking at things like using natural foreshore areas to help. Uh, we're doing, actually, it's the first pilot in Canada to create a, a, a living dike, a green dike, um, that uses natural foreshore uh, components to combat wave action. Um, so hopefully once that's completed and it'll be multi-year, we'll have this, you know, how the how is this working and what is the example that we, we can use in other areas um, to replicate that? Because, uh, you know, we have a marine component to our city. It's not just a land-based municipality and it's forefront in regards to the potential for flood inundation um, due to sea rise. Um, so we're very cognizant of that because there's a lot of people living down there um, with, you know, multi-million dollar homes and, uh, you know, basically there's a dike and then the ocean. So um, we have to be cognizant of that and looking at other, you know, solutions other than things like forced retreat or raising the dike. It's not all about those engineered solutions anymore. Yeah. Um, well, one thing, like, yeah, our time is running out to a degree, but I just want to mention one thing that you sort of said that this project was initiated and there's going to be so much learning from it, so much applying of what you're learning and it's useful information across the board. So I know that, so when we were thinking about the Green and Green Spaces Program 2022, we thought, well, for sure, the ones in 2021, um, we would love them to participate again. But what we'd like to know from the sites is uh, some of the outcomes that have been seen, unexpected outcomes or those that were sort of planned into it. And so uh, we do have an application form that's sort of a renewal. And it is, again, with the same sort of principles and criteria. But really what we're asking for is all of the, the learning that happened. What was the community response? What was 
you know, some of the anticipated or unanticipated um, outcomes so far or output. So uh, we, we can't wait to actually sort of see, and we hope that that will be forthcoming from, from you, from the city. <laughs> and it is- Send me a reminder. <laughs> no, I, we will, we will be, yeah, prompting all of those in 2021 to say that these sites, and we mentioned it before, they're they're not static sites. They're they're put into place, and this is one where it was created from a you know a brown um, a brown site. So it's it's sort of coming up into its own. And as you've been mentioning, it's it's not something that you can always anticipate. There's going to be some jockeying from the plants of which ones are going to come out. But it's also the the idea that you had some signage, but you're going to increase the signage. There's been community interest in this. It seems like the council is ready. It seems like the experiences from last year's heat dome also play into the idea that um, these spaces are valuable for so many different reasons. And so, yes, we are going to, to prompt and, and hopefully make sure. And, <laughs> and the idea is, and our executive director mentioned this last week on the webinar, that when we have a map of these sites across the country, um, it's going to be really important to see which ones are, are geographically nearby and which ones are also in the similar category. And yeah, when you mentioned this Douglas fir eco type, yeah, that's just, that sounds incredible. I would love to be looking at the ocean and just even what species are there. It's so different. But I think that other municipalities that, that are doing this in site specific areas have a lot to learn from how you've approached this. So we do expect and hope that the, the number of sites from the different years will continue to grow. And that, yeah, the, the logo, which we um, revised this year to um, just to, we had a student who came in and helped us with the communications, but that it will become a logo that is significant, that is going to be well recognized in terms of the general principles behind the work that this is, that this is taking place. And it was very nice for you to say, and it's good to hear about the, uh, the pollinator steward um, certification as well. Um, those, those are just other ways of entry points into sort of how to, the commonalities between the ways that these sites or their, their main focus is, is on. And yeah, I think we need to have that in, in our profession, um, whether it's municipalities or with um, private practitioners, um, it's just good to have that certification or recognition when the work is being done and our platform is really just to to be those the organization that is saying Yahoo! Like this is fantastic. This is going on, and um, and it's exciting work, but it's also an opportunity to learn and to to continue furthering this. Yeah, and it'll be useful over time to see. Um, one would hope. I mean, you know, Seoul's been around for quite a while, and would, we would hope that it would continue to be so. Um, to, you know, for these projects, for me, the biggest thing is, you know, with a background in restoration ecology, knowing that sometimes these are, you know, intergenerational. Um, and that's always the, you know, I think one of my biggest concerns is the sort of like the disconnect in institutional memory that happens in large organizations about, you know, somebody going back and saying, what's this site here and who was doing it? You know, what's the history? What's the story behind this site? Um, you know, we hope that that's not the case. Um, that's why it's really important that this is, you know, has become more of a collaborative initiative. You want to build that foundation for ongoing conversations so that even if staff come and go, that the projects or that, you know, the management approaches that we're taking, that that um, lifelong learning gets passed on, that there's a mentoring and succession that happens uh, in that regard. Uh, and that well, when, you, when you talk about the is a, as a specific site, but also um, you highlighted the role that it plays in the connectivity. So are there some staff that are really sort of focused on the whole and how Surrey, with all its development population increase, um, th that it's going to manage to have that connectivity that we know is so important instead of fragmented, but really where the wildlife species can, you know, have corridors to go through. So is it also looked at in that perspective? Um, it certainly is by me because that's part of my job to actually, you know, be that broken record in the city, um, you know, to provide that context. Um, but I think there is sort of growing recognition of that. Um, as I said, you know, my position is only three years old. So this is, you are legacy building in regards to the, you know, for me, the work that I'm doing to, to make it so that 
Um, it is second nature to us. That's part of our, our lexicon in, in regards to the, the language that we use in park planning um, and just you know planning in general. We do have, um, I noted at the beginning, we have the sensitive ecosystem development permit area. So that does kind of entrench the biodiversity conservation and green infrastructure aspects of things. Um, but you know, what does that mean? Because that's really all typically involving private land. And, you know, we have, you know, only a certain amount of control over how that evolves. The biodiversity design guidelines were designed as a tool to help that backyard biodiversity private land conversation um, come to fruition a bit more. But also how do we take all of that and then bring it into the work that we do as an organization? So, you know, across departments, there's varying levels of um, how that's been adopted and, and how that's been recognized. And so it will be an ongoing thing to actually get more consistency in that regard and get that buy-in, you know, so it isn't just sort of these one-off projects or it's like, you know, Pamela's harping about this because it's part of her job sort of thing. Um, I'm not alone in this organization. You know, I want to be very clear that I am part of an incredible group of people who, you know, are very supportive of these objectives. Uh, and so um, it's all about mainstreaming it as opposed to it, you know, potentially just being a, a nice to have thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we really appreciate you coming in today. As mentioned, your, your talk was very um, informative and um, had a lot of content there. So we will be putting this up on Seoul's website with your permission. And mm -hmm. from there, we hope that lots of people will be um, able to connect with it when we begin to promote, promote it. So thank you all for coming today, um, and in particular, Pamela, for you. Um, and we look forward to connecting again next week. We've, we're continuing the series of focusing on greener green spaces uh, for the rest of July and August. So please um, stay in touch, stay in tune with what um, we're putting out there and join us again. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.